are in listen only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first webcast of 2017. My name is Christine Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of APA's New Urbanism Division, and I am your webcast moderator. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, uh, or you can call that 1-800 number that you see in bold. And for any content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in that questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. And we'll answer those uh, at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Um, soon, we will have a list of our 2000 17 sponsors, which are our APA chapters and divisions. We are uh, currently uh, getting our list together for the year, so stay tuned for that. Today's webcast, in particular, is uh, sponsored by APA's Arkansas chapter, and you can learn more about the Arkansas chapter at ArkansasAPA.org. Uh, on your screen is a list of our upcoming sessions. Um, obviously, this is the very beginning of the year, and we're just starting to get rolling for the season. Um, so please check back on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast, um, for our upcoming sessions. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just head over to planning.org and log into your My APA account, and then um, you can search uh, by CM Activities, um, and you can either put in today's webcast name or the event number, both of which can be found, again, on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And this, this session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We will have some recorded webcasts available for distance education. Um, we're in the process of applying for those for 2017. We'll have an ethics session and a law session, both worth 1.5 CM credits, respectively. Um, so stay tuned for uh, the list of those on our webcast webpage and also on Facebook. So please join us if you haven't, planning webcast series on Facebook to receive up-to-date information on our sessions. Uh, and any changes that might be taking place with our sessions that are already booked. And we are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel after the session ends. Just head over to YouTube and search Planning Webcast. And we'll have a PDF of the session also available at the end on our webcast webpage. Again, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Chris McEntrick. Uh, she is the previous uh, president of APA Arkansas, and she was also at one time the president of the Chapter Presidents Council of APA. Uh, she owns um, a, a small firm, I, I believe in Little Rock, if I'm yes. correct, good. Uh, so I'm yes. gonna go ahead and turn it over to her to get us started. So, um, Chris, if you want to go ahead and click to show your screen from that pop-up I sent you, and it's all you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our webinar today. I wanted to just kind of give you a brief rundown of why we're doing what we're doing today. I served on the APA board for a number of years, national board, and during that time I was very active in legislative affairs and working with all of our chapters on our legislative programs. And one of my key uh, programs or things that I wanted to accomplish was to have a policy guide for climate change which has since been updated and is in a constant state of updating. So I think in 2016, given all the stress from all the politics that was going on and uh, how so many people still don't see climate change as an issue, I felt like it was important for us to try to get down to the nitty-gritty of what specifically can planners do to mitigate the effects of climate change uh, and to get 
their communities to realize that there is a problem and that it does affect them and their businesses. And uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Platform met last summer and they stated that climate change is now affecting every country on every continent. It is disrupting national economies, affecting lives, costing people, communities, and countries dearly today, and even more for tomorrow. Uh, people all over the world are experiencing uh, the negative effects of changing weather patterns, rising sea level, extreme weather events. Uh, just recently, I saw in the New York Times that for the third year in a row, uh, we have broken climate, uh, we have broken temperature records yet again. So here are the facts, and most of you have seen these if you've seen Al Gore speak about uh, the changes in, in the climate over the, uh, the past many years, how the oceans have warmed dramatically from 1902 to 20, 2010, so that's really nothing new, but it still is a major issue. Now, how can we address climate change in our own unique jurisdictions and have the support of the citizens of the community? First, we need to talk to people about climate change in a way that they understand. I just listened to a woman uh, talk the other day, uh, her name escapes me, but <laughs> she was talking about how we need to be able to speak to people on a level of what is to affect them, their homes, their businesses. Uh, not talk about polar bears or things that are often in, in India or someplace like that, but how is flooding affecting you, droughts, forest fires, uh, sea level rise, those kinds of things, and what can we do in our communities to mitigate the effects of those in the future? Uh, how much trouble are we in? For future generations, we're in big trouble based on what's happening right now. Right now, it doesn't seem like it's so bad, but for future generations, it is a big deal. Is there anything that we can do? And I'm just shortening this all up. Uh, this is based on a really nice article from the New York Times where they try to give you bullet questions uh, about or, and bullet answers about how we handle this when talking to the community. Is there anything we can do? We can fly less, drive less, and waste less. What is the most optimistic scenario? And there's really not one, but several things have to break our way. Uh, the Earth may turn out to be less sensitive to greenhouse gases than we first thought. Uh, we may be able to manage plants and animals to adapt to change. We don't know how much that's going to happen. One of the biggest worst case scenarios is that scientists have tried to tell us at the limited possibility the worst case scenario is happening could be the whole breakdown and collapse of food production. Uh, and I have also done some research where farmers right now are, and uh, ranchers and people like that are experiencing all kinds of issues with shortened growing seasons. Uh, all the kinds of things that they've always depended on in terms of the climate are all kind of screwed up. And this could cause the collapse of food production and uh, mass starvation. So that's like the worst scenario. Uh, important questions to consider forward. Will we have a tech breakthrough? Uh, and even Bill Gates says we will not have a tech breakthrough unless we put the money out there. Obama recently, right before he has gone out of office as of today, wrote a check to uh, the Green Foundation, one of the big international foundations, uh, for quite a bit of money to help work through the technical issues that need to be done to, to help us mitigate climate change. Uh, and I think some of you may have been in uh, one of the conferences that we had a couple of years ago about how much will the seas rise. We're not sure yet, but we know that they're rising and that is something that can't change. How reliable are predictions that we have? Well, they're as reliable as they can be based on science that we have done up to this point. They're not perfect, but the science is there. Uh, and important questions to move, consider moving forward. Why do people question climate change? Why do they not understand uh, what the crazy weather is doing? And who will benefit from global warming if, indeed, global warming happens? And some people say, well, there will be some benefits. Well, in the long term, there may be some benefits to countries that are in colder areas. But in the, sh uh, but in the long run, they, too, will suffer with people having to leave countries and areas that are affected by climate change in a negative way. Well, let me go on. We have two great speakers today, and I want to introduce them and uh, 
get them going because they have a lot to say. Mike Leiden is the principal of the Streets Plan Collaborative. Uh, that is an international award-winning planning, design, and research advocacy firm based in Miami, New York, and San Francisco. With Tom Garcia, Tony Garcia, I'm sorry, Mike was a recipient of the 2017 Seaside Prize and the co-author of Tactical Urbanism, Short-Term Action for Long-Term Change. And I think they're working on another book or already have it completed. He can tell you more about that. And he's going to be talking about community resiliency and what his firm is doing. And what he, I, don't, I know he's working with a lot of communities on this right now. Our second speaker is Mitch Silver. He is the uh, commissioner of the New York City Parks. And for those of you that don't realize that, that is a huge undertaking. It's a 30,000 acre park system. And since becoming commissioner in May of 2014, he has led the launch of the Community Parks Initiative, which is bringing 285 million in capital overhauls to 60 historically underserved parks in the city of New York. He's also working on a project called Parks Without Borders, a new design approach to activate park borders and edges and an $150 million effort to rebuild five historic parks uh, in each borough. He's going to focus on the new reality of climate change, building a resilient city, and talking about Superstorm Sandy that was a wake-up call for the city of New York. Uh, I'm going to turn that over now to Mike, and Christine is going to put his slides up. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, happy to be here. Thanks for the introduction, Chris. Um, my slides here are not yet showing. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about um, really what we can do now in the short term. And for anyone who knows the work that we do, we do focus a lot on quick things that communities can do to get quick wins to build momentum that leads to intentionally lasting change. So the street plans, um, as was mentioned, we're in three different cities and the research advocacy side of our work is really, really critical to how we inform our practice and inform our clients on thinking through new ways to deliver positive changes in communities um, across the country and internationally. Um, the core of our work is uh, street design, a lot of active transport work and cycling and walking as well as placemaking, what I'll describe today as, as tactical urbanism, and then working those kinds of projects within urban design and land use policy frameworks um, as well, and et cetera. So uh, this was already mentioned by Chris. This is kind of shocking. I um, came home from a long vacation over the holiday and was expecting you know, New York City to be about uh, you know, 20 degrees, 25 degrees, if not colder, as it tends to be in January, our coldest month. And I got off the plane and it was 54 degrees. Um, since I've been back, I've been riding to work every day on my bike uh, without having to wear gloves. Um, by, any <laughs> by any account, this is not normal. Um, and as we see with the data, it's only going to get warmer and warmer. Um, climate change as, a, as an issue, I think, is also embedded in what's largely now called urban resilience in terms of the challenge of creating communities that respond to these challenges in a holistic and systemic way. Um, the definition, as you see on your screen, of urban resilience as defined by 100 Resilient Cities, the Rockefeller uh, Foundation program, I think is spot on. Um, if, if you boil it down, it's about chronic stresses and acute shocks. In the 21st century, we're seeing a range of these issues um, playing themselves out almost on a daily basis across the globe. Uh, on the left there, you see a couple of examples of sudden shocks, particularly that relate to uh, sea level rise or climate change, floods and hurricanes, and then chronic stresses. Uh, things like, uh, yes, urban planning. I think <laughs> urban planning is both a stress and being stressed by all these changes that are happening, and I'll describe that in a minute. And of course, things like auto-dependency, where we are exacerbating challenges um, that are facing uh, the future and, uh, of, our, of our country and of the globe. So stresses are induced in two uh, basic ways. One is nature. Uh, this is an image of uh, the, the downturn of Christchurch in 2012. And for anyone who knows the story there, most of the downtown was flattened and demolished based on uh, two different earthquakes that could not have been predicted and could not necessarily have been controlled. Um, leveling the downtown has since um, created a lot of challenges in terms of building that back. And it's not just nature, it's also nurture. So what we as humans do to plan, design, and invest in our cities. 
or in this case with this image, this is an American city, a downtown, the lack thereof, the lack of nurturing community and public space and, and all the, the things that result from a single mindset in terms of planning, which has dominated our, our work for, um, for several decades now. So in, in economic terms, you know, we, we've, we've known from the research of 100 resilient cities and many others that it's a lot more expensive to rebuild after disasters, whether that is, uh, in the sense, a natural disaster or perhaps it's nurtured. Um, you know, I, I take the example of the previous city and the lack of transit in that community, or the, the transit that's been removed systemically in the 30s and 40s from that community, and now coming back to the tune of you know millions, if not billions, of dollars. It's a very, very expensive proposition to deal with these challenges as we have them today. Uh, but fortunately, uh, lots of cities are taking resiliency and taking climate change head on, creating action plans, which is which is fantastic, creating whole sets of um, policies and, uh, and, and frameworks to address a lot of these, these core challenges that they impact specific uh, geographic locations in a strong uh, interdisciplinary way, which is, which is a great first step. But this is really expensive. You know, let's take Miami Beach, which is perhaps one of the um, communities in the United States that's facing climate change challenges first um, in a very visible way. They're already spending hundreds of million dollars on, on ways to deal with the, the consistent stress of flooding, which started impacting that community probably seven or eight years ago on a regular basis and is only been getting worse. Um, you know, it's really going to require a lot more political will. When we're talking about spending hundreds of millions and billions of dollars in the coming uh, years, we need that political support. Um, as, as Chris referenced, you know, we don't quite have um, a majority of people who find this to be a really, really important major issue that has to be dealt with quickly. This graphic here from the, from the Pew Research <coughs> Center as shared on CNN, CNN sorry, shows us that uh, about a third of Americans consider climate change to be a big deal. Um, that's a problem, and we need to get more and more people um, to understand the real impact to, 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 their, to their daily lives. And again, yes, not just polar bears, but how this is going to impact someone's home, their business, and their family. Um, and an action, of, as I mentioned just a minute ago, is only going to make things you know, more expensive and challenging as we go. So the time to act is absolutely now. And to build the political will, we need to get people to really experience the opportunities that they can, the impact that they can make on their community uh, and quickly. But what change is hard. You know, whether you are working with a community on a uh, pedestrian master plan, you're talking about much bigger issues such as climate change, getting people to go from concept to reality is one of the biggest challenges that we face as, as planners. And education, of course, is a huge part of that. 80% of our plans, as according to one study, just don't get implemented. And that's going to be another very big challenge as we take these action plans and climate change plans, you know, how we move them from plan itself and plan document to on the ground, from paper to pavement, so to speak, is a really big issue. And one of the things that we focus on are what we call tactics for creating change. And as the great Jane Jacobs once said, city planning tends to lack tactics for building cities that work like cities. So we need new methods for building resilient cities and combating climate change together. And what I'm going to show now is a couple of examples that show how from the, the bottom up and the top down, we need to find new ways to collaborate to make these uh, investments happen faster and be more effective and to educate people along the way. And I think if, anything's, uh, if anything can be learned from the last, uh, say, year and a half of the election cycle, and of course from moving forward from today, and a new tone set for our federal government, is that we probably all need to be focusing even more on the local things and local action that we can do on our blocks, on our streets, in our neighborhoods, in our cities. So I'll give you a quick overview of, of how we're using this tool of tactical urbanism to deal with these challenges. Some of you might be quite familiar with this, some of you might not be, so I'll, I'll try to go through this. Um, tactical, the word, right, it's all about the small scale things that we can do to serve a much larger purpose, both in the midterm and the long term. Uh, tactical urbanism itself is a city or organizational and citizen-led approach to neighborhood building using short term, low cost, but scalable interventions that are intended to create that lasting change. 
if you want more information or resources about this line of thinking and this practice, we've written a lot about this. Um, a lot of these resources are online for free and can be accessed um, by our website. We've also just released a brand new uh, resource called the Tactical Urban Guide to Materials and Design, which focuses a lot on public space and street safety and transportation projects across the United States. And this work was funded by the Knight Foundation to put these, these tools and resources and this guidance in your hands. You can also access that via the Street Plans uh, website. So in essence, it's what we can do today. You know, it's about getting community groups and city leaders together to make change um, quickly and about building that momentum for improving our cities in the longer term. So how do we take this idea and actually incorporate it into a typical planning process? Well, that is something that we've been working on a lot at Street Plans and been working to uh, get cities to understand how this fits into the larger framework of policy development, plan creation, and moving those plans into implementation. And ultimately for us, it's about changing our outdated software, so to speak, our policies, our programs, how we get projects built, the project delivery process, and translating that into better hardware. So building the kind of infrastructure and building the community support for that infrastructure that will be needed to help combat the negative effects of climate change. So I'm going to give you two examples today. Um, this first example, we'll talk about Burlington, Vermont, and a bicycle pedestrian master plan that we've been working on there which has been one of our biggest successes in getting a community to totally onboard this approach into their planning process. And then from there, I will give you a second example of a slightly larger city in Norfolk, Virginia, where I will discuss how we've been uh, working with uh, the uh, 100 Resilient Cities program in the city of Norfolk to empower and educate citizens and other organizations to make change related to um, recurring flooding, which is an issue of climate change and resilience that that city is facing. So in Burlington, you can see on the map there, this is their existing bikeway network. Um, the orange or the, the orange lines, what you see there, that's their bike on-street bikeway network, so bike lanes and shared lanes. And the green lines there are the uh, bike paths. So for a lot of communities, especially of its size, it's done fairly well to get a beginning uh, of a network to be built. Um, and you can see the results because of the compact city, the grid, um, and the population that lives there, they already have a 25% uh, bike walk mode share, which for a small city is, 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 or any city really in the United States, is outstanding. But they have a really big goal to move that further, to create a sustainable transport system that would bring their driving trips down to about um, a third, as opposed to being over half. So here you see a future which we have planned and designed with the city, um, where a whole really dense network of streets would have protected bikeway infrastructure or very robust traffic homes infrastructure on the ground and moving that mode share of bike walk well over a third of trips. Um, but again, remember, going from vision to reality, as we all know as planners, is very difficult and it's very expensive. If for no other reason than the political challenges of getting people on board to invest in this kind of change in neighborhoods and streets. While we've been working on this project, um, it was, you know, when we started this project, really a, a, um, a parent actually came to the city and said, I want to try one of these pop-up bike lanes and help get my kids to school safely. And the city, to their, uh, to their credit, looked at this proposal and said, hey, that's a great idea. This is in, in line with the kind of thinking we, we have going on right now at the start of our new master plan, and we would love to be able to say yes. However, we have to say no, because we have no policy framework and no way to encourage this kind of grassroots um, uh, project to actually take place on public city streets. And when we heard about this, we thought that was a real shame. And we said, there's actually ways that you could actually say yes to this. And in fact, Burlington, if you look at your own history, you'll see that one of the greatest you know, economic drivers in your community and one of the best elements of your, of your uh, downtown is a street that used temporary pop-up projects in the 1970s to actually build momentum and educate people on the possibility of making a much more people-friendly space. The slow slide. And that is what the street looks like today, which is the probably the most busy and the economic center not only of Burlington, but of the um, state of Vermont. Um, so to get there, we said we can actually proactively harness the civic energy, take proposals and the energy of folks in these communities, and, and put that to good work in service of 
um, building political will and support for bigger ideas like um, sustainable transportation. So we, we pitched an idea to the city. They, uh, they accepted to their, their great credit and said, let's create a policy where citizens are allowed to go out in the neighborhood and actually develop their own projects to create sustainable streets and better public spaces. And of course, designing this was a challenge because we're trying to make this simple enough so that anyone in the community could take, take this, this, uh, this demonstration project policy and guide and, and go run with it. But also we wanted to cover all the bases that the city was concerned about regarding liability concerns and making sure they could trust the community to go out and do these projects. So we worked through this uh, very carefully with them and then decided to pilot test our own policy by implementing actual projects on the ground with a few different community groups, including an advocacy organization called Local Motion. So with about $4,000 of um, funding from, uh, from city council, we worked with local and neighborhood groups to go try four different projects that were consistent with not only our, our master plan that was in development and the kinds of rec uh, uh, projects we were putting in, in that plan, but also that were consistent with our policy. So we could really give it a, give it a go. And of course, the goal was community engagement, so reach people in a very different way in terms of outreach around the master plan itself, and then to test out this, the, the draft of the policy to see what worked and what didn't. And very quickly, I'll run you through what that looked like on the ground. Uh, this was, uh, it's called Pine Street, and this is the morning before the, the city's largest art fair, which happens once a year and attracts about 10,000 people. And what we understood is that it becomes a very uncomfortable street to walk because they keep the, the street open to traffic, and you're talking about 10,000 people on a five foot wide sidewalk for many, many blocks. And so the idea was to create a series of curb extensions and public spaces that could act as a release valve and to create that very, very quickly as a way to showcase what curb extensions and more public space could li look like on the street and how that could make the street safer, more comfortable, and encourage you more people to walk. And of course, it's a really wonderful way with 10,000 people on the street to get a lot of feedback on a variety of different concepts as it relates to sustainable transport. Further uh, uh, north of this location, we worked on three different bikeways on the same weekend. And the idea is that we'd create really robust um, uh, parking protected infrastructure and protected bike lanes that would connect to open streets, which is when you tempor temporarily close off streets to allow cycling and walking to happen that actually happened to be occurring that weekend. And we knew there'd be another 2,000 people or so attending that event on that same weekend. So we thought this is another captive audience that we could utilize to build awareness about these options. And so that's what that street looked like on North Winooski Avenue uh, with a temporary parking protected bike lane. We were able to get a lot of feedback from the community in a, in a number of different ways over the course of that weekend. Here's another street which was, uh, we had these centers that were uh, created to create this uh, protected bike lane. And then a neighborhood greenway which linked the two uh, major corridors to the open streets route. And of course, collecting this data and the, and the feedback and getting response from, from stakeholders like the fire department was absolutely critical for us to learn what designs were working and not working on the street and why. And of course, you know, even improving intersections. What we learned was that uh, the speed of traffic uh, uh, was reduced um, without causing congestion on these two major corridors, which is, is great news. We learned from the responses. Uh, we had hundreds of surveys responded via a, um, a text is in, so a text message based survey system um, on the kinds of streets where they wanted to see more of that robust infrastructure, which helped inform our plan. And then we learned that actually developing um, demonstration projects like this would be very, very challenging for community groups if they didn't have the assistance of engineering firms or somebody at the city to help walk them through how you create a traffic management plan in other words, how you shut down the streets temporarily to install the infrastructure um, before you open it back up to, say, uh, motor vehicles. And so this is something that we learned very quickly in the community that a project of this scale would require some level of expertise. We had to account for that in the policy in which we were creating. And ultimately, we came up with a better design for the street. So this is the existing corridor, which has a conventional bike lane. Um, what we learned from the test is that um, the parking protected option is probably not the best, but that many of the, the people who live on the street don't actually park on the street, they park behind their homes. And the folks who do park on the street are typically those who come from outside of Burlington to work or to shop, who park on this street just north of the downtown to avoid paying the parking meters. So the 
only through the test were we able to talk to all these folks and really learn how the street was used and feel much more confident that we could actually take the one lane of, of Long Street parking off to create, in the long term, a much more sustainable street with stormwater management, a mountable curb which would uh, satisfy the fire department and, and emergency responders and still get a very robust protected bike lane um, in the longer term. And then the city learned that a lot of the improvements that we made with volunteers that were actually quite exciting and they could go out and do themselves. So within six weeks, the city was out there making a handful of the improvements that we had actually tested during that demonstration weekend. And then since scaled that up. So now they're testing a variety of materials on some of the key corridors in the city um, that have been identified for protected bike lanes. And so you, this image shows the North Avenue pilot where we've got two different um, uh, materials there to help uh, separate moving vehicles from, from cyclists. And then the advocacy community learned that they really needed a toolkit to help them take this policy and run with it and to be able to work with communities on, on implementing um, uh, the, the policy itself to actually get people excited about being able to, to do this kind of work themselves. And so we helped them design a trailer which is now full of materials um, for these types of demonstration projects which is now driving around the state of Vermont. And so local motion, which does work statewide, um, can roll up into a community roll up the materials and they can test out a series of these ideas, you know, of course at a, at a block scale or a couple of blocks in scale to uh, educate people about the possibilities for this long-term investment in sustainable streets. And then finally to end the story, uh, what was so heartening is that NPR actually covered um, the development of this, this policy as it was inspired by uh, Peggy O'Neill, who is the, the, the student mom's, the, the mother of the student I actually talked about earlier who proposed that initial pop-up bike lane. Uh, for her daughter's school. And I think what's a really important lesson here in what's transferable to any kinds of projects that you're working on is that over the course of a year we were able to move actually quickly to take some a citizen's proposal, which is a good idea, and actually build a policy framework for action around that to, um, to create lasting change. And what's important is that it really creates trust. And if we're going to actually invest in uh, infrastructure large and small, there has to be more trust in government to be able to do this work and more collaboration with between cities and, and citizens. And that's the real power, I think, of that story in Burlington. So how do we more specifically apply this to, to climate change? Uh, well, I'm going to end this with an example from Norfolk, Virginia. And if anyone knows Norfolk or perhaps lives in coastal Virginia, um, you know, like Miami Beach, it's one of the, the areas in our country which is threatened the most from rising sea level. Not only that, climate change is exacerbating um, the rainfall that they're receiving on an annual basis. So they're getting water coming up through the storm drains at high tides, uh, and they're also getting water from above with more rain events, and more intense rain events, not to mention the threat of hurricanes. And so as this becomes a more regular um, um, uh, challenge for the city to address, the city can't go out and, uh, can't go out and actually create long-term changes by themselves. They're going to need help of citizens and businesses and other partners. So Norfolk was one of the first cities onboarded above 100 for 100 resilient cities. And so they've been working at this for about three years. And they create a really robust strategy to deal with their various challenges, which are uh, both um, you know, climate change based, also economic and social challenges that are impacting uh, the resiliency of the city. And I want to call your attention to goal number three, which is to advance initiatives to connect communities, deconcentrate poverty, and then strengthen those neighborhoods. And the strategy behind that was to improve access to information for citizens and to connect people and facilitate dialogue that could advance community building efforts. So in a partnership that we have going on right now with, with 100 Resilient Cities, we are creating what we're calling tactical resilience workshops and projects. So it's taking the idea of tactical urbanism and applying it to resilience challenges in cities across the globe. And Norfolk was our first test case where we wanted to take this resiliency plan and the goals I just mentioned or highlighted, um, goal three, and just anchor that into a community. Show people on the ground what this kind of change can be and how they can make this change themselves or do this in collaboration with the city itself. So we put together this workshop with, um, with other partners such as Foster Amick Wheeler, which is a large engineering firm, is a platform partner, 100 Resilient Cities, of course with the city, uh, with IOB as a way to crowdsource uh, you know, resources and funding for small-scale projects, and other uh, local partners in, in the city of Norfolk. And the idea was that we'd actually build out 
um, uh, uh, rain barrel and other types of stormwater uh, mitigation infrastructure over the course of, of one day. And so we held a workshop with about 50 participants from three different neighborhoods, which were the most uh, adversely impacted by um, rising sea level and, and climate change in Norfolk. Here you can see some of the participants in that workshop. And the idea was that we wanted to really anchor the types of projects that, that community groups and nonprofits and others can do at a low cost and which are quick and at, which at, at scale can make a longer term impact, right? So no one person's rain garden or one rain barrel is ever going to solve the, the Norfolk's flooding problems, but if you know dozens and dozens and hundreds and hundreds of these little projects get built over five years, 10 years, or 20 years, it's going to start to add up to start to you know, lessen the impact of the nuisance flooding and more, which is impacting the quality of life and businesses in the city of Norfolk. And one of the key examples we wanted to show to them to give confidence that this can be done and be done quickly and go to scale is the work of DPAVE, which is a nonprofit organization in Portland, Oregon. And that community organization does incredible work actually working with groups to go out and remove unneeded asphalt and replace with permeable surfaces, stormwater treatment uh, infrastructure, and public spaces. Sorry, that picture is a little bit blurry, but you can kind of see the before and the after. What was once you know, a uh, impermeable surface now becomes a beautiful public space and garden next to um, multifamily housing. So this program or this approach in Portland started about uh, you know, seven or eight years ago. Um, in the last five years in particular, they've gained a lot of momentum and have been you know, funded by the EPA and by the city of Portland. And they've actually depaved more than 135,000 square feet of asphalt. Um, they've diverted more than 3 million gallons of stormwater from their storm drain system, and they've engaged more than 2,700 people in the process of doing these small-scale projects. So any one DPA project is not going to make this long-term big impact, but at scale, as they keep going with this work, it is making a, a difference that's really important to not only the you know, resiliency of the city, but to the quality of life of its citizens. In fact, um, if anyone on the phone is, is from Portland or has visited there recently, especially in the summertime, you know now that the, the Willamette River is uh, actually swimmable for the first time in many, 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 many decades. And so the, the water quality has uh, dramatically improved to the point where this is now incredible civic space that can be utilized in the summer months. Um, and that's, that's quite remarkable. And DPAVE is not a, you know, the only entity responsible for that, but they certainly has played a role by keeping stormwater, polluted stormwater, out of the Willamette River shed. So back in Norfolk with this, you know, sharing that strong example, the point of our workshop was to go from classroom to action. And so we picked the nearby uh, well, sites, a couple different blocks, and here we have an alleyway where we wanted to hook up different rain barrels to the backside of various businesses to help retain rain once the once you know stormwater, or sorry, the uh, rain events started to occur. And so we worked with the fire department, we got them up on the roof, and we started blasting water down through one of the drain spouts. You can see we even dyed the water green, so it became very visible. And we actually calculated the time it took to go from pipe to the drain system about 150 feet away. And we wanted to show, after we hooked up the rain barrels, how that would slowly impact immediately once water entered the system. And so with you know, all the different community volunteers at that workshop, we went out and we installed four of these different rain barrels as you can see here, four different types, uh, which are quite low cost and easy to do. And then we train them on also doing little depaved projects themselves on sidewalks to uh, create tree wells and planting strips. And of course, um, on the bottom you can see there we work in a parking lot to create a rain garden as well. So three different types of you know, block scale uh, green infrastructure that can be implemented quickly and very, very inexpensively and be used as a training for these community leaders to go and then uh, work on projects in their own neighborhoods with their own business leaders, et cetera, to make these, um, uh, these projects scale up. And of course, um, you, might have meant, you might have seen the, the title of this, this workshop was Boxes, Barrels, and Brew. And so after the, the implementation was done, we celebrated the garden and had kind of a big uh, learning festival where lots of different organizations and companies and, and other suppliers were there to, to keep educating people about the materials and the opportunities that they can use to, to make sustainable change on their neighborhood streets. And of course, we gave away some rain barrels that were decorated by kids at the end of the day. Now, the results of this workshop were, uh, I won't go through all these. Uh, you can look at this more closely when you get the, the PowerPoint um, sent to you after this webinar. But I think the key takeaway of what we learned 
through this process is that the biggest barrier to citizen-led partial level stormwater mitigation projects are going to be the cost. Even a few hundred dollars for doing these projects is a big barrier for a lot of folks. And then the permit to get permission from the city to actually do it. And so one of our key recommendations for the city moving forward, in fact, our number one recommendation was that there should be a, a guide and a supportive policy and framework, much like in Burlington for sustainable streets, for this kind of infrastructure. And there should be some modest level of funding that is you know, seed capital to help neighborhood groups go out and do this work, uh, along perhaps with partnership with organizations like IOB, which help crowdfund neighborhood scale projects such as this. Um, so a takeaway and one we, we you know, the city's working on to implement so that this can be more scalable, like in Portland, across all the city of Norfolk. So these small projects wind up creating big and lasting change. As far as our, our, our next city, in terms of the 100 resilient cities and tactical resilience work, we're just now starting some work in Thessaloniki, Greece, where we're looking at public space as being a really big challenge in terms of the, the, um, the programming, the use, and the sustainability of public space in that city as a key driver for resiliency. So we, you know, we, we see resilience and climate change and public space and all the place making this is all interconnected. And working on these issues means we need to work on all the issues uh, collectively to make those uh, the, the change that we need in a, in a lasting way as it relates to the big issues um, of climate change, even at the local level. So to sum up, you know, we need planning processes, policies, and, and programs that actually can respond to the 21st century challenges. I think we're really struggling with the process of making these changes. Um, you know, at, the, at the policy level, not at the feasibility or at that scale. Um, and also that we, we need to engage citizens and city leaders uh, in a completely different way. So there's hands-on trainings and workshops and applications for groups that have the ability and interest to further the goals that a city might be developing and, and, and uh, adopting through a climate action plan, through a resilience plan, or just your typical neighborhood or citywide comprehensive or master plan process. And to leave you with a little inspiration, this is uh, Albion Square in at Littleton, New Zealand. Littleton, New Zealand is just adjacent to Christchurch. And much of this community was destroyed during the same series of earthquakes. Uh, one of their signature public spaces was destroyed, and they built it back very quickly using very low cost and temporary material to give the, the community a place to gather. This is a town of about 2,000 people. Um, within a couple of years, the temporary space became permanent. Here you see the plaque marking the impact that civic groups and citizens can have on their city, no matter if they're a small city or a big city, in creating lasting change um, that creates resiliency. So the final point here is that you know, I'd like to impart is that you know, res resilience should really be joyful and be inclusive and can lead to a lot of really fantastic benefits beyond just green infrastructure or the, the quantitative way that we measure sustainability. So I think with that, I will turn it over to Mitch Silver, who is going to give you a fantastic overview of uh, the park system and all the work that he's been doing here in New York City, which is also where I live. So this is, this is my commissioner of New York City Parks, delivering another great um, series of examples and lessons learned here um, from the city um, of New York. So over to you, Mitch. Okay. Well, uh, hello, everyone from New York City. Uh, so Mike did a very good job at showing uh, small-scale, affordable, tactical interventions. I'm going to really do a larger scale uh, from a government response. Uh, some of you may know a former president of APA, also planning director of Raleigh, North Carolina. And one of the reasons I was interested in coming back to New York City, my family was personally affected by Superstorm Sandy uh, and wanted to come back uh, to play a role with resiliency. Uh, so to put it in context, you know, New York City, we believed in climate change, but it wasn't real until Superstorm Sandy. Uh, that was really a reality check. It wasn't even um, a, a hurricane, as some people call it. It was a storm. And uh, I have to say, being here two and a half years, um, I have a new appreciation uh, for what resiliency looks like on the ground. And now here in New York City, we understand what it really means uh, to address um, climate change. So what I want to point out, which may, you may not realize, but New York City is really a coastal city. And New York is at the forefront of climate change, so we take sea level rise very seriously. We're expected the sea level to rise one to two feet by 2050, and then two to four feet by 2100. And New York City parks and public spaces are often the first line of defense against severe storms, not only on our shores and beaches, 
but also deep within the boroughs as well. Uh, as, so you understand that it's painfully illustrated by the storm that's flooding a significant threat to neighborhoods uh, throughout the city. So to put that in context of why we're a coastal city, there are over 520 miles of coastline in New York City. You're looking at a photograph of the Hudson River. This is Riverside Park South. Uh, and also, of that 520 uh, miles, uh, about 155 miles is within parkland. So I have a direct responsibility for that first line of defense to rethink how we plan parks in the future. Not only are they places for recreation, because many of our parks, as you see, is on the waterfront, but now they also have to play a dual role of being that first line of defense. And very often, as you'll see through my presentation, that can be a challenge. Because people like the concept of climate change, but then when you start to build it into the system, there's a lot of pushback because you have some hard choices. You know, do you raise walls so you can't see the water any longer, but you can protect lives and property? Those become some of the challenges that we have to face here in New York City. And added to that, we also have, I have jurisdiction over 14 miles of public beaches. And uh, this is a picture of uh, uh, Rockaway, which is one of the hardest hit, hit places. And so we had to change our strategy about how we even care for our beaches in New York City. Uh, so while uh, we attended our public beaches to be passive and active, it's now becoming a clear threat to climate change. And our parks and coastline are now, as I said, our first line of defense. And so you were looking at Rockaway, but I wanted to show you exactly the impact of Superstorm Sandy. Here in New York City, cost uh, really the, it created 725 million of damage in 392 park sites. But more importantly, two-thirds of the most vulnerable population uh, live within a half mile of the flood zone. So you're looking at a picture in Staten Island. The middle photograph is the Rockaway Fordwalk, which just sheared right off of the support structure. We'll come back to that later. And then you're seeing in the far with Red Hook, a neighborhood uh, that was really hit hard and was, you probably saw the national news. So for us, it was something we had to take very, very seriously. So in terms of New York City, uh, the map illustrates the inundated areas uh, that are hashed in pink, then the evacuation zones in taupe, and then the 392 sites I mentioned that were inundated are in solid pink. So that begins to show you how vulnerable that our city is. And the Rockaway is the one, I can't really point to it, but it's taupe. It's the one that looks like a peninsula. Uh, that was the one that was impacted probably more than any other area, as well as uh, Staten Island, so, uh, which is the one that's off uh, to the lower left-hand corner. Uh, that's what we now have to understand and deal with. And the green is parkland. And as I stated, it really changed our attitude about how we had to plan for parks uh, in New York City. So I'm going to share with you what New York City is doing. Uh, first, uh, the previous mayor created the Office of Recovery and Resiliency. Their role is really to oversee all of the agencies, it's not just parks, that have to protect lives and property in New York City. And what you're also seeing here is a beach replenishment project. The Army Corps literally pumps sand from the bay, I'm sorry, the Atlantic Ocean, and then we start to create berms and plant it. So that becomes one level of defense as we change the way we plan in the future. So as I mentioned, there's now a new reality in New York City. Uh, we're working with uh, several agencies in the Army Corps. Uh, we pumped 4 million cubic yards of sand. It was returned back to the beaches. We built a new boardwalk that is no longer wood, but concrete. And we have other projects planned and underway. Now, now let me just explain what it meant about going to concrete. A lot of people have a sentimental relationship to our landmark boardwalks, Coney Island being one, the Rockaway being the other. It was wood, in some cases on concrete structures, in other cases on wooden piles. We replaced it, and you'll see a photograph uh, shortly, that it was all concrete. That was a big battle. People wanted to be protected, but they also wanted to see the wood, and we said that it was no longer resilient. In fact, the tropical hardwood that we were using was being taken from South America. So by actually building the boardwalk to protect against climate change, by eliminating the rainforest, you're actually increasing the level of climate change. And so we came up with a policy that we would no longer use tropical hardwood. It was controversial. It's controversial till this day. The community is kind to uh, fight back by getting the 
existing wooden boardwalks landmarked so that if it is damaged, it has to be replaced with landmark, but they just don't like the concrete. The Rockaway community, which was hit so hard, was an exception. They opted to be more safe, and they went for the concrete. Uh, in Coney Island, we did a combination of a concrete base with recycled plastic, but it was still very controversial. So all of you that are dealing with these big projects, when people talk about climate change and how you have to deal with it, uh, could become a problem. Hoboken, New Jersey, which is on the other side of the Hudson River, they were also inundated, and their approach is actually to build about an eight-foot wall. Now, people want to be protected, but then they realize they lived in Hoboken because of the waterfront views, and now to elevate, because there's no other remedy they can figure out to have that wall there, is counter to how they want to deal with it. And here is the concrete boardwalk that we built. Uh, it includes both uh, a raised berm, and you see what we call Moby mass because now people have to walk. We lower them some points in the summertime because the lifeguards have difficulty if someone is hurt uh, or injured to climb over uh, some of the mounds. But this is what the new boardwalk looks like, and in fact, people love it. You can bike, rollerblade, uh, it's better for strollers. Uh, the wood, wooden boardwalk is very difficult to maintain. It has about a two-year lifespan before you have to start uh, drilling it back into the supports, uh, and now we have a five million, I'm sorry, a five mile continuous boardwalk, and people actually love this section. And now people are safer, it functions, but in other parts of New York City, they still want the wooden boardwalk, uh, and they're still fighting for it. So that's an ongoing battle that we're dealing with. Uh, <clears throat> so another uh, approach that we've taken is that now we have a new design approach. Uh, prior to Superstorm Sandy, we just planned for our parks. Today, we now have a new criteria for all of our staff that all projects that I get to see must show a floodplain map and where the project is located. That then changes the way we plan for that park. Uh, for example, if it's in the flood zone, we will not use synthetic turf because they're not resilient. We want to make sure that the trees are salt tolerant. We lost a lot of trees during Superstorm Sandy due to the saltwater inundation. If we look at the landscape, we look at materials, we make sure it is very resilient. And so that is our approach that we now take going forward, and rather than using wood, we'll use concrete and recycled plastic. So this is an indication prior to Superstorm Standing, you didn't even see this map. And it also helps the community to understand when we do make some of these planning decisions, they now understand why. So this is to build a lot more resilient and sustainable site dealing with the effects of climate change and flood risk. And something else that we've adopted, uh, I don't know whether you have similar uh, extreme events, but we now come up with specific zones and we have a whole bunch of technology behind it. So when a hurricane is uh, going, you'll see the map in the left hand side, we ask people to know your zone. We have six zones and when the threat of a storm is coming, each zone has a specific response and will tell the community that if you're in zone two or three, this is what you need to do. It also alerts the city about what we have to activate in terms of shelters, hospital evacuations. It is a great way for us on emergency planning side to do better planning. So one of the things that we're doing, and I encourage, I don't know how all other cities deal with these threats, is that knowing your zone and where the threat is coming is a great planning tool, but also organizing tool. I've been here for the potential of one hurricane, and I was in the room for the first time, and I was glad because we were, uh, we start about 72 hours, then we go, we have these benchmarks where we say it's going to be two or three zones are going to be affected, and we have a playbook of exactly what we need to do. So our commitment after a storm like Sandy was that we're going to be better prepared when the storm does hit. Uh, what else is good is aside from the, the Office of Recovery and Resiliency, uh, I have this new initiative called Parcel Up Borders, but what it's allowing us to do is work more closer in the public realm. Uh, we don't care if it's DOT property or parks property or DEP. We now look at the public realm as one seamless unit. Uh, we're working better, so even though this is DOT property, parks maintains it. We expand it as a green street. In some cases, our buyer swells, but we now have a better relationship, and we actually have a team that works together between environmental protection, which is basically our our water, stormwater, uh, and sewer system, you know the Department of Transportation, and then design and construction is a department that builds a lot of our public works. We now have a great relationship and we're better prepared to use our assets 
to have co-uses versus just for roads or just for parks. Some of those examples should be no surprise is green infrastructure. All these examples you see here, whether they're permeable services or stormwater retention or bioswales, we're using this more and more. Uh, and even most of our new parks, small playgrounds that are asphalt, we eliminate the impervious surface and the slide you see on the upper right hand corner that has stormwater retention underneath. We're using it more and more in our parks as a way of capturing more stormwater so that we can uh, keep our streets uh, from flooding a lot less. So here's just one example working with DOT. Uh, we implemented this project and now it eliminated uh, this flooding that occurred at this condition, whether it's a severe storm event or just a regular storm. Uh, we're able to now capture the stormwater and do a lot better job, but I'm sure this is something that you're all doing in your local communities. Uh, also, uh, we have this commitment uh, in New York City to create a resilient city. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the elements of neighborhood buildings and infrastructure, but for us, coastal defense is the one I talked about, and so there's an intense focus to make sure that we protect our citizens and property. And this is regardless whether people believe or don't believe there's climate change. We're seeing it on the ground, on even some minor storm events. The flood maps are helping us plan better, and now we're coordinating with the Department of Environmental Protection to do planning in one of our neighborhoods near JFK Airport gets routinely flooded. This is a multi-billion dollar effort, but it's one that we realize is a way we have to deal with the effects of climate change. So one of the initiatives is that we're trying to strengthen our coastal defense, attract new funds for vital projects, and adopt policies to support coastal protection. If you do want to find out more about these projects, you can go to nyc.gov slash 1NYC. Just to give you a sense, you saw the flood inundation map earlier. Uh, these are all the projects that are either underway or being planned. And so we're taking a very active approach, uh, little by little, of uh, starting to harden uh, all of the areas that are vulnerable in our city. It is expensive. We realize recovery efforts are even more expensive. So we believe with the threat of climate change going up to four feet by 2100, we believe we don't have an option being a coastal city. So we're being very, very proactive. One of the things for buildings, if you come to New York City, uh, you'll now see the mechanical equipment is all raised, even for office buildings uh, to uh, a certain level, because many buildings in lower Manhattan uh, were inundated with water. And as a result, all new buildings must now elevate it, I believe, to the second or third floor. So you'll see it's very odd that you'll go into a lobby, you have to go up a series of stairs before you even have to get to the lobby. And that's one of the things that we're changing in our building code to ensure that we're smarter of going forward. So uh, I have a video, and I'm hoping it's going to work, but I wanted to share with you from our perspective some lessons learned. One, and it, it's something that I realized coming here, is that if you are a flood-prone community, we encourage you to document conditions that you know are flood-prone because when you go through the FEMA reimbursement process, if you have no photographs and can't prove it, you will not get reimbursed. Fortunately, for many of our projects, we did well on FEMA reimbursements because we constantly do inspections of our parks and had good photographs. But there are other areas where we didn't. And as a result, we weren't able to get a full reimbursement. So I'm now asking staff to go around through all of our park assets, take photographs and date it. And we're trying to do this on a regular basis. Uh, because they'll only reimburse you to what was there, replacement, uh, and so that's something that's quite key. We also have to manage the public expectations through the FEMA reimbursement process. It takes a long time, and it will affect businesses and, and lives to get back on track. And the one I had mentioned earlier is that to deal with climate change may not look the way people want it to look. They have memories of place, they know what it looks like, but when you start to put in the investments to protect people in property, uh, it may not, you know, you may not have the wooden boardwalk. You may not have the view you used to have as well. So for us, that's something that's very important to manage. As a planner in Raleigh, and I'm sure all of you have hazard mitigation plans, our hazard mitigation plan was run out of the city manager's office or the emergency manager's office. As a planner, I got involved and used that document uh, and weighed in so that we were able to implement policy changes that while it was a hazard mitigation document that the federal government required, we were able to use that to number one, communicate the threat, but also use that document to make some planning policies to make the cities uh, or your town safer. The other things we're doing is that we're now implementing more green roofs to trap, uh, trap stormwater. 
We're using more solar on top of some of our uh, buildings. And the one I'm going to now switch to a video is that we now are looking at our street trees as one of the best ways we can contribute to reducing the heat island effect and also air quality and storm water. I'm going to switch gears to a video. Uh, we manage, uh, I oversee over 600,000 street trees and over 2 million trees in our parks. We just completed our third tree census and this is showing a way that the public can help you care for these trees because right now 21% of our city has a tree canopy. We want it to go up to 26% and we're already seeing how that is cooling the temperatures in the city on particular properties. And so now I'm going to switch gears and share with you a video. And I'm going to have to, uh, hopefully you can hear it. brings our urban forest to your fingertips. For the first time, you have access to information about every street tree in New York City. Whether you're on your desktop, your mobile device, or out exploring the city, you can discover the street trees around you. On the map, you'll be able to see information about nearby trees, including their species and size. All the information you'd want to know about your tree is now in one place. It's the same information used by our own foresters. You can also use the map to report a service issue, or you can share information about your tree on social media. As you explore, you'll learn more about every tree on your block, in your neighborhood, and across the city. More than 130 species of trees line our streets, each one with its own story. Discover which of these trees can be found near you and compare your area with other neighborhoods and boroughs across the city. Just like the urban forest itself, this tree map is always growing and we update it every day. This tree map could not have been created without the thousands of volunteers who helped us count every tree in the city during the third tree count. 2015 yeah. to 2016. I'll check the calendar. Yeah. accomplished big things together, and that's why this map offers the tools you need to care for our urban forest. Whether you're helping us water, spread mulch, weed, or plant flowers, you can log in and record your activity. We'll keep track and show you how much you've given back to your urban forest. You can see the activities taking place on trees in your neighborhood and find the smallest and most vulnerable trees to see where you can focus your care. And you can learn more about local volunteer groups and events so that you can join in with other tree lovers. With the New York City Street Tree Map, you have the tools you need to help shape the future of the forest around you. Visit our website to get started today. So I hope you enjoyed that video. It's our way of really working with our tree can a tree canopy in our urban forest to ensure that our uh, we address both uh, heat island effect, uh, improved air quality, improved water quality, and just also have a greener city. So with that, I will conclude, and then I will turn it back. I believe it's to Christine uh, for questions. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so folks, if you have questions, um, feel free to type them into the chat box in uh, the webcast toolbar there. Um, it doesn't look like we have any right now. Um, Chris, I think, were you, did you have any concluding thoughts that you wanted to uh, talk about? Yes, I wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, I have talked with uh, Christine and with Ben Frost that help organize the planning website series. And I hope to have a couple of more uh, webcasts this year, webinars this year on climate change and how planners can create specific policies and activities uh, on a local level 
to uh, help mitigate the effects of climate change. So uh, keep your eyes open for that. Uh, I don't know exactly what months it's going to be yet or who the speakers are, but I do want to do a couple more. And also, I am trying to get a sense around the country uh, of what, climate, what issues you have in your communities that you can directly relate back to climate issues and climate change issues and would hope that maybe you could send me a little summary of that. So I'm trying to kind of produce a compendium of issues and problems that are going on around the country. So you could please send that to me at mcgetrkeng at aol.com. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have a couple questions coming in now. This is for either of our speakers. Uh, I noticed um, that the topic of the effects of drought were not touched on in the presentations. Um, could one of you or both of you please speak to that? Well, I can share from my perspective uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina about the effects of drought. Uh, in 2007, 2008, we experienced a drought uh, when in our region we were down to about 60 days of water in our reservoir. Uh, what we did at that time is we quickly, uh, well, we, we did a couple of things. Number one, we changed the way our water bills, the water was managed by the city to show people exactly how much water they use for what purpose, but also actually put out a challenge about how many gallons per day per residence uh, they were using so people can calculate but it was a wake-up call, and it was the first time that we tried our water conservation approach, and it worked because it gave some, and it was right during our conference and planning process, so we used that as an educational um, opportunity. Uh, we started, of course, building a second reservoir, but it changed everyone's attitude about what they did in their front yard, about how water is used, the introduction of rain barrels, uh, and so from our point of view, our drought ended, luckily, in 2008, but it lasted for about a year. Not as bad as what's happening out in California, but it did change our approach and our attitude about using more uh, recycled water for golf courses and campuses, and the city tried to at least partner funding some of those places so that they would no longer uh, use uh, regular water but actually use recycled water. Um, it was just a big sea change for our city, so I agree. We didn't talk about it. But um, there are loads of examples of other cities, and I'm sure California has taken their approach as well with their extreme droughts. Uh, but it's something that even though in the past it happened and it went away, it was something about the 2007, 2008, where a conservation uh, finally struck. Uh, and uh, so that's something I agree is something we need to pay attention to. And this, let me just put, also put this in. This is Chris. That's what I hope to address in the uh, uh, upcoming webinars, specifically drought and uh, forest fires and, and the implications of drought as part of the climate change issue. So I hope to have some speakers uh, talk specifically to that in the next webinar or, or the next one. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, hey Mike, could you please um, go into a little more detail about what technical urbanism is, please? Yeah, sure. So uh, tactical urbanism is an approach to project delivery that uses very short-term and low-cost projects that are trying to either test out concepts and plans that are being created or have been created, um, or to also educate and involve the community in applying changes to the built environment. That could be developing a pop-up temporary park to see if the community wants a park in a certain location. It could be, as I demonstrated in the, in the presentation, different changes to how a street is designed and how it's functioned. You know, these, these kinds of projects sometimes last one day. They can last up to many, you know, several different, um, over several different years uh, while you're getting kind of continuous feedback. And so it's a way to <laughs> learn and plan by doing. And then learn, you know, what you, what you learn is then able to be fed back into the process um, before you make long-term investments. And so we look at it as a very intelligent way to make sure that you're getting your, your design and building community support for the right kinds of projects, um, transportation-based or more green infrastructure or public space or whatever it might be. Thank you. 
All right, Mitch, we are getting a lot of questions um, about, which I'm not surprised, about the Tree app. Um, this is a pretty cool system. And the questions, um, let's start with uh, how, how, if you're able to give this information, how many residents have actually used it? Is it popular? Is it working? Um, it is, are there kinks in the it system? Is. Uh, it is very, I, I don't have the actual numbers because it keeps escalating and now we're in the time of the year where we don't see the tree care pick up as much because it's uh, this time of year. But when it was launched, it was insane. Um, the, the numbers were spiking each day because you could actually pick your local tree and there were people that were tweeting, I'm going out to water it today, to mulch it. It was phenomenal. It went actually global. So you can check it out uh, You and by just NYC tree census or tree map and it'll pop up um, and so you can love your tree you could tweet it uh, it is phenomenally successful and we've already seen and we can see it we can tell exactly how people are caring for their tree in their neighborhood uh, so it's something that's been phenomenally successful and I believe it's already received one award but it is just it, it is usually successful and there's a lot more interaction because the point is that we knew uh, we had to increase the survival of our trees, and when we have tree stewards, which our map and census told us, part of the census was that, is it cared for, and we have some signs of whether it's cared for, or we're now seeing an increase in the tree care by our tree stewards in New York. But I don't have the numbers, unfortunately. Okay, that's fine. In terms of the software itself, um, was this like a off-the-shelf kind of thing, or was this custom built specifically for the New York it Parks? Custom, it was custom built in-house. We have a very huge uh, team that actually builds a lot of our programs, and so that was built in-house. Okay. So please don't ask me what the platform was. That part I don't know. That's but we fine. have some very talented, yeah, we, we built it in-house. Um, are you able to guess, I suppose, how much a program like this is worth and how much it might cost to implement okay. one, build one, and implement one uh, in other communities? Very difficult to say, but I'm sure my staff, we're very open, we're a public agency, that if someone, I don't want to inundate them with a lot of phone calls, but I'm sure if someone is interested, I could put my team in touch. Uh, we have a lot of programmers here, put them in touch to see exactly what is the process to actually build it in-house. And they probably can estimate how much it would cost if you get a third party to do it for you. Great. And do you know of any other cities or communities that have utilized some type of system like this, platform like no, this? No, we're the first. We're the first. We got a little bit jealous when Melbourne, Australia was how you can send a love letter to your tree. And so we knew with the tree <laughs> census we were going to able to top it. Yeah, people were sending love letters to trees and they were sending love letters back. So uh, we knew we were competing with Melbourne, Australia, known as the most livable place on the planet. But we're in New York, so we have pride. So our staff uh, came up with another technique where people could also love their tree. Uh, so, uh, so it's something that my, we don't believe anyone else did this, but also you have to understand we had a million tree campaign to build one million trees, and we did that in 10 years, we did it in eight years. So uh, New Yorkers now love their trees, and we're now seeing the effect of having cooler streets for people to walk on. Great. Thank you. Okay. So let's switch gears for a second. Um, have either, well, any, any of uh, the three of you uh, used PACE before or have heard of it, property assessed clean energy financing as a tool to help fund or finance building energy efficiency projects? And I if haven't. so, what has been the reception in your communities? I haven't. No? I have heard of it, but I have not used it. Okay. No, I have not heard of it. Sorry. Okay. PaceNation.us to find out more. <laughs> okay, Pace okay. okay. That's what it is. So next, is it, oh, go ahead. Okay. And so it's P-A-S-T-E? Oh, no, 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 P-A-C-E. Property okay. Assess okay. Clean Energy Financing. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Got it. Sorry, Rachel, nobody knows. <laughs> um, next question. What happens when and if the height of a retaining wall proves insufficient and storm water surpasses it? There were actually a few questions related to this. Well, in our case, uh, we don't just, 
When you say returning wall, if it's existing, then that's something you just have to deal with and see how it can be re reinforced. We look specifically and work with the Army Corps of Engineers. We're now looking at earthen levees. In a beach application, we have several lines of defense. There's an earthen berm at the beach side. Then you have the hardened boardwalk, and then there's more application on the land side. Uh, so we take a fresh look and see why that retaining wall failed. But I don't know if you mean a retaining wall on the seaside or just a retaining wall within a flood-prone area that's a neighborhood. So I'm not sure I know what the question is. But if that's the case, the property owner has to deal with it. If it's the city, we take a fresh look on how we have to elevate it, raise it, or rebuild it, reinforce it. Okay. Thank you. And if they type something any further to clarify, um, I'll jump in and let you know. Um, what sources of funding are there when um, these types of improvements are being made in advance of potential flood damage, so not submitting flood damage claims? It's, it's a capital plan, and that's a commitment. So you are committing your capital dollars. Uh, it's part of the infrastructure, and for us, we have to weigh do we pay a little now or do we pay a lot later and potentially lose lives? So it is a very difficult decision because people are saying you're spending all these billions of dollars for potentially one storm event, but that's the decision the elected officials have to make. Uh, we look at the most vulnerable areas first, and that's where we target uh, our initiatives, but it's now something the taxpayers support because a Superstorm Sandy is about four years ago is still somewhat fresh in people's minds. We're still rebuilding back. We haven't rebuilt all the areas back. So it's still fresh in everyone's mind. Okay, thank you. And and has the improvement in flood prevention, um, does anyone know if that has actually helped homeowners regarding flood insurance costs? Uh, I don't have that information. I know we have an office to track it. And I do know that we're working with um, well, certainly what we're doing is we're elevating everything above floodplain elevation, mechanicals, first floor, breakaway first, uh, you know, the ground level. I, I don't know that answer. I would assume yes, but I just don't know that answer. Okay. Thank you. Um, and just to note, um, I've been getting some questions and comments that are on the political side of things, um, and I'm erasing those. I'm not going to discuss them um, over our webcast well, today. So if yeah. um, those folks could stop sending in those questions and comments because they're they're not coming on the air. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next question. Were there any studies done to determine the roles of urban parks to mitigate effects of climate change? Oh, yes. And if uh, so, we actually have specifically uh, call some of those out. All right. Um, we do have something coming out soon. It's not out yet, but we did a whole study and have a whole toolkit on how to deal with our parks. Uh, before I got here, we already, as I stated in my presentation, uh, since close to a third of our coastline is parkland, we now understood the important role that parks play, not just for recreation, but now we know it so serves multiple purpose. And now primarily it's either a first line of defense or for stormwater retention. So we have that report. It's not ready yet, uh, but I'm sure we're not the only ones that are looking at parks as part of our infrastructure for, for climate change and resiliency, but it's something that is very effective and will be more important going into the future. And I, honestly, I have a feeling um, we did Plan NYC, and I recall there being sections in that report, you can get it online, it was called Plan NYC, that had sections on resiliency and the roles that parks play in dealing with resiliency and climate change. As well as one NYC, both documents. Okay. Um, next question. Climate change can favor some species of trees and destroy others. How is uh, New York City budgeting for replacing vulnerable species as they die off from climate change? We, we have a whole forestry division of close to 400 people, uh, wow. and this is exactly what they study and look at. We do know exactly what species are more salt tolerant, which ones are more resilient, and because of the tree census, we know exactly how many trees of what species and where they're located in our entire city. If you heard 
the narration by our commissioner of forestry, we have under over 130 species. So right now we have, unfortunately, uh, a new disease coming our way, and we're able to pinpoint all those vulnerable oaks that the borer, it's a call a borer, will affect our trees. So now we know what we should plant, what we shouldn't plant, what are invasive, what are not, and then what are fair better in salt tolerance. So that's our whole forestry division focuses specifically on the species, where to plant that, and we want to have a diverse forest, so we make sure we're not 50% of something. We plant a variety so that our urban canopy can stay resilient and grow over time. Thank you. I had no idea as a planner I would know this much about trees, believe me. <laughs> I can tell you about FR and open space ratio, but I had no idea about all these trees and species, so it's been an education for these two and a half years. Who knew? <laughs> um, Mike, can you talk a little more about the rain barrels and um, like what what happened to the water that was collected um, and um, if they were near businesses or residential and landscaping use with the water, things like that. Can you just kind of go dive in a little more yes. with that? Yeah, of course. And I know I had to go through things relatively quickly. So there were four different businesses that were partners on this project. Um, and the, the, the alleyway, which I showed, uh, Magazine Lane, um, during a, a fairly heavy rain event, this is an alleyway where the proprietors of these businesses have to actually build little bridges to access the back. So they, in that alley or by that alley, they have to they access their properties typically through the back door. And so they've been putting down pallets and other little wooden bridges to cross the alley because it gets so flooded um, during a, a, a fairly heavy rain event. So they were totally game to get these free rain barrels that the city donated. Um, set up behind behind their properties with the hope that you know this would help at least slow the the, the flow of the water from roof to pavement to drain. Um, the amount of water that we put to the downspout to you know to simulate a rain event um, was only so much. You know we had a couple different uh, fire department uh, members up on the roof and they you know we let them blast the water down for about I don't know what it was maybe a hundred seconds or so or maybe two minutes. And then we just were able to look at the flow rate um, you know, and the speed from exiting the pipes to the drain system itself. And when we installed the rain barrels, and we installed four different types to kind of show a variety of ways this can look aesthetically and in terms of function and capacity. And we found that um, the water, of course, absolutely did, did slow its rates from leaving the downspout into the drain system. So that was enough proof on the ground to show that before and after there was an impact that could be made. Um, and of course, those barrels only have a certain capacity. If there was a rain event of certain size or, or duration, then that uh, rain barrel is only going to last you so long, right? Um, but it's, again, it's the idea is that you're actually retaining and slowing the, the, the highest volume of rain off the roof. It tends to be the most polluted um, from getting into the system from the beginning of the rain event. Um, and so, in terms of the, the landscaping, you know, we we had other. Um, plant elements that went into these different rain barrels um, there are planters that are used as such so that was nice for people to then plant those and see the range of species they could be working with that were appropriate for Norfolk um, and that was also in the rain garden um, that approach taking the rain garden and the tree wells um, um, as well thank you um, I think we have time for have time. one more question um, this is interesting. So, uh, regarding the retaining walls in coastal areas, how do you determine the most serious risk, the worst case scenario? scenario? And do you regulate uh, building of retaining walls and seawalls on private property? Uh, well, in our flood prone areas, we really don't have private property. It's all public. Um, but if it is private property, uh, we have, because of the severity of the storm, uh, may work with the homeowner to make sure they are protected in those rare cases in Staten Island. Uh, but most of our shoreline and waterfront areas, for the most part, are public. Unlike other places, we require public access. There is, oh, there is one location uh, where there was some damage, and I do believe the Army Corps in that case uh, assisted them because it was just too expensive for them to protect themselves. We look at the most vulnerable areas based on the areas we know that receive the most damage by storms. So in New York City, we knew it was the Rockaway, Coney Island, and Staten Island, and Lower Manhattan. 
and that is where we're prioritizing our dollars first. Other areas like our food system that really serves the entire city, which is in the Bronx, if that was flooded, uh, basically our food supply would have been out for indefinitely, and so we protected that area. So we have we under we know where the vulnerable areas are, and we have, have projects. If you remember that map I showed you of New York City, there are either projects underway, completed underway, or now um, in the planning stages to make sure they're protected. But we know where we're vulnerable based on our flood risk map. Okay, thank you. Well, we're going to go ahead. Oh, in terms, yeah. well, I'm sorry, I was going to answer. So, in yeah. terms of the application, it varies based on the location. In some cases, the seawall. In some cases, an earthen levee. In other cases, it's a hard boardwalk. So, depending on the park type asset uh, and where it's located in Manhattan, we're looking at walls, which people love their uh, esplanades around the island. And now we're dealing with putting up a wall somewhere along the edge of Manhattan. And as you can imagine, that's very controversial, but there isn't enough land to berm or do other type of levees. And so it depends on the urban context or suburban context of how we're going to build the remedy. And we do work closely with the Army Corps to figure out exactly what that is. OK, thank you. Um, Chris, Mike, and Mitch, thank you for joining us today on our first webcast of the year. And thanks to the Arkansas chapter for hosting this webcast. And uh, look forward to uh, listening in on more webcasts from them. And thanks to you all. Um, again, if you have any questions, you can uh, get our contact info at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast and there you'll be able to download our presentation and uh, get a link to this uh, uh, session. So thanks everybody and have a good one. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.